and welcome to a freshly grounded, the brand new podcast. Well, it's not exactly brand new anymore, is it? Welcome to freshly grounded, the podcast. That's better. Created by best friends, Faisal and Sam. Huh? Welcome, I said, welcome to Freshly Grounded. After that bit. Created by... After that bit. Best friends, Faisal and Sam. Really? Okay, we're on. Assalamu alaikum wa nam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, bro? Alhamdulillah. You well? Alhamdulillah, in a different country. Uh, it feels different, but alhamdulillah. It's You're amazing. living here now? I'm living or, here or now. Or is that public knowledge? Is that it is public knowledge. Okay, uh, for the most part, I'm settled here. There's uh, still a few things that I got to work out. Fine. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, I'm here. Alhamdulillah. How are you finding the kind of transition from LA to London? Um, it's an interesting transition. I think that um, it's a bit of a weird one for me because I think when you grow up in a place, you don't really know what... Um, what's good and what's bad because you, you you grow up in your surroundings are pretty much all you know so when you go to different places that's when you kind of start to see like okay this is different and this is different so i think growing up in la i think it was pretty much just like uh this is normal to me coming here i started to see things that were different but for the most part um i like that the differences are there and i enjoy them way more so being here um i think for the most part, it's it's been enjoyable and alhamdulillah. Uh, the transition, it wasn't really a rough one. There's always that period of just like getting the routine back, but it's kind of getting there for the most part. So alhamdulillah, it's good. What's different? What's different? I would say for me, um, for the most part, um, the main thing for me would be the deen, so the religion, level of practicing, and I think just the community in London. Uh, it's really different than the community in L.A., um, I was kind of involved with an Islamic organization for a few years, so I got to just just see the community in LA, basically. And basically, um, it's just not as big, and it's just not as tight knit as it is here. So that was a big difference, and I didn't even know it was a difference. Like, if you were to ask me how is the Muslim community in LA um, years ago, I would have been like, "Yeah, it's it's good. It's there. We've got like a mini white chapel. It's like three blocks. It's not <laughs> much, but <laughs> it's called Little Bangladesh, so that's there." So I was like, "Yeah, it's it's a good community." But then you go to other places other places in America or you go to places like London. So you come here and then you see that it's really not that strong or big to be honest. But, um, that was the main difference I think that I saw and I was prepared for that difference, which is kind of like one of the reasons why I always thought about coming here and moving, um, amongst other reasons. But, um, I think that was a big difference and that drove me to kind of just, just like Kareem, like he was just like, it's just a bit easier for you here. Although there's much better places to be. Of course. Yeah. I, I often say to brothers that when it comes to, as as difficult as it is here, which it is, mm. when it comes to like Western life and stuff, mm. London or England is probably one of the most easiest places to practice religion in some ways. Right. And like, I've, for example, if you compare it to what I'm talking about, if you're just looking at the West, like mm. hijab's not banned here, mm, yeah. niqab's not banned here, mm. you can pray your five salah a day in the masjid. Yeah. Uh, there's there's masajid, you know, it's, it's in London anyway, mm. everywhere. So there's halal meat in London everywhere. Very easy to butchers find. Butchers and restaurants and stuff like that. Mm. So, yeah, it is. And But I, I suppose as someone who's not been to the States, uh, it's... Kind of surprising, but also not surprising that it's not similar in LA because yeah. LA is obviously the the big place that <laughs> you hear about yeah. in movies, in TV, yeah. on the news, uh, and it seems like so much happens there. It seems yeah. so big, mm. and so naturally you'd think that it sounds like there's a lot of diversity there, and you would so think therefore so. That's what's crazy, is that you wouldn't mm. be hard to kind of practice the religion in some mm. ways. Yeah, I think the thing is that it is a diverse place, which is good because. Uh, Maybe you won't be targeted uh, like you would in some other places, but you'll definitely be looked at a certain way if you were just a person who wants to practice the religion. Um, and so that's the thing about LA. It is that place where everyone goes to, and it's just known as the place to be for X, Y, and Z industry. But um, although there is diversity, I still think that it's unfortunate that having such diversity doesn't really do much for the tolerance for Muslims. So we still don't feel, well, at least I didn't really feel the most welcome and I, f uh, I think that's the case for a lot of other uh, Muslims in LA they just it just it just feels a bit hard 
uh, as opposed to being, I mean, I'm kind of speaking from the East London perspective. It's just from what I've experienced there, it just feels like you're an East like, London and you're like, an East Ender for <laughs> for for a few days. You've been you've been an East Ender for about a week now. Too. About a week, yeah. It feels like Bangladesh to me. So for me, it just feels like uh, it just feels so easy for me. And obviously, there's parts like I went country the other day. I went Hastings. That was a different experience. It wasn't very welcoming for 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 a Muslim, but yeah, you said that you, somebody came up to yeah, you. And put, yeah. What did they say? So um, I was with my wife basically, and so what happened was we we were just casually at this um, lake area. So we we were in this caravan area in Hastings, so pretty much uh, countryside. And this uh, older gentleman came, and he pretended to look at the lake for like thirty seconds, and then he came up to us. And then what he did was he was just like, uh, you're right. And then it was like, yeah. And then he was like, can I ask you a question? And I'm so like, he seems polite so far. He seemed polite. So I was like, okay. And then he's just started going at it with why do women have to do this? Why do you have to do this? And my natural instinct was I'm a foreigner. I don't know anything about this country, how the people, are. if this was America, I could very, I could turn on the down mode and just be like, oh, but here's what we believe. Right. And I'll explain why. But there it was just like, I'm in a new country. I'm with my wife. And it's just like, I, I kind of give them a very staunch response of we're Muslims. And this is, these are the things we follow. And here are the rules. That's it. And then he was like, no, no, no. But I don't want that kind of response. I genuinely want to understand. So he was seeming to be genuine. But maybe he was just not coming off in the right way because the way he was saying things, he was like, oh, but this is ridiculous. But I just want to understand. So I was like, yeah, it seemed like okay. he was ready for a bit of an altercation. But then at the same time, he was like, but I'm nearing the age of death. I'm yeah. 60 now. May I just want to understand these things. So I was like, maybe he does want to understand. So it was like a 10, 15 minute discussion. We didn't really get anywhere, unfortunately. But at the end, I was just like, I tried to bring it back to, I think people, when they ask questions about hijab uh, or... Um, a big questions like that right it's very hard to explain to someone who doesn't want to hear it because he was like i'll never understand it and i'm like but i'm trying to get you to understand if you say you don't want to understand it then it's a bit closed-minded you know so i was like I, I want you to understand and he was like but i'll never understand it and i'm like okay i tried to bring it back to we believe in a creator we worship this creator he knows because yeah. you bring it back to worshiping a that sort of thing is going to help them understand because before we can even get to the big questions about um the controversial questions that right. non-Muslims want to ask, we have to bring it back to the idea of this creator. And once you have Allah in your mind and you understand that we have a creator and we want to worship him, and he knows what's best for us, this sort of thing, the rules start to get easy because you're like, oh, well, although I don't really understand this, this creator knows what's better for me and I can just submit to these rules. I can submit to him and then he knows what's best for me and that sort of thing. But he, he wasn't getting, he was like, why, why are you talking about, why are you talking about a creator? I'm just asking about this specifically. And so it kept going back to that. And yeah, it was, it was a bit tough. I left it at, you know what? I think there's an age gap. Here. I'm, I'm with my wife here. Leave us. <laughs> that, that, that's kind of what I wanted to go for. But what happened was I was like, you know what? I think the best thing to do is if I'm not getting on, this is an opportunity for that like to be real i just told him go to any mosque that you're going to go by they will welcome you with open arms just go and ask questions go to personal knowledge me i'm I know, I know very little i can give you just the basic information i'll probably still be wrong maybe so check out your local mosque just walk in ask them questions i'm sure you will get the answer you're looking for all i have to say is just be sincere in that quest to learn the answer uh and i think you'll like what you see that's all i said because i was like it was one of those where it's just like that's just too weird. I was just in the country and this guy's coming up to me. He came all the way out of his caravan. I'm like, uh, I've like, there's been bigger enemies in Islam than someone who comes out and is just saying things like, oh, this looks ridiculous or you're ridiculous. So, and, and those bigger enemies of Islam, like Khalid bin Walid at one point, right? They became the best of Muslims, right? So it's just like, if you just want to say something like, oh, that's ridiculous, that doesn't mean much to me. Like, it's really not that hard for you to be guided. So uh, just, you know, go walk into a mosque, ask questions and may, uh, inshallah, inshallah, it becomes some. I, I find the, this, I find da'wah so hard. Like the, like it was direct da'wah, I find it very difficult. Like speaking one-to-one -one with somebody, I admire those who can do it. I find it awfully difficult, but I think that it's something that naturally is not going to be easy because it was the job of the prophets. And um, yeah. like you said, if I got to a point, so, the little that I do know is like you said, when you get to a point where, no, no, not even when you get to a point, you, I know that enough to know that you should start with uh, and always try and take it back to Tawheed, like yeah. you said, right? Tawheed, and, and I was just like, of course. This, he, he, like, it, once you understand this, everything else will just follow and there will be less questioning of why this, why that. Oh, 
no, I don't need to ask why. This creator knows what's best for me. Allah knows what's best for me. I just submit to him fully and I don't have to worry about anything. That's the true, like, that's the liberation everyone's seeking. That's the happiness we're all seeking and we can get it through that submission to Allah. So that's why I tried to bring it, but he didn't really. Yeah, he didn't want to hear it. Well, and uh, what I was going to say is at the end of that, I often would uh, probably direct somebody to uh, one reason to org. And I think, that's why, okay. I think that's why that website exists. It's by Aira. Mm. And they kind of, under, they like... Uh, specialize in in these like direct conversations right yeah and so i think it's let me have a look one reason dot org uh because yeah and it's basically like ever wondered how you got here it's all about mm. that like if you're like i just want to know like i'm towards the end of my life yeah and so i i often think that it is better to wear any field if you like genuinely feel like you can't you're not going to represent it well yeah direct to the, to the right place. Mm. We often at Freshly Grounded get uh, messages from people who say that they're going through really tough times, right? But yeah, these yeah. messages are big issues that f that we don't have the capacity to either manage or they are so big that uh, we're not we're not knowledgeable enough or skilled enough yeah. to understand so or to yeah. understand it from a, from a wisdom perspective as well. However some people tend to trust us mm. with like these these big issues and i'm talking like they could be issues of like uh divorce suicide okay. stuff like that yeah and so we have this one uh because uh, we had a guest on fresh Uganda before and they kind of deal with um uh, accounts they do like deal with like islamic counseling and stuff like that it was my tazkia or an arm of my Tesco or something like that. Okay. I can't remember exactly. But I the brother the brother uh, Osman we interviewed mm -hmm. we had him on Fresh Grounded. And um so he kind of said to me after he said, Look, um, if you have big issues like that, yeah. forward them on to um uh, this email and like they have like counselors and stuff who can kind of handle That's that stuff it. a bit better. Yeah. And so it, I I always do find that it is so much better to forward these things on yeah because you don't want to i guess drop the ball in that sense because it's such an important weighty thing and you it's still get the reward of handing thing. it to someone who's a person of knowledge in that regard so you still get rewarded for passing it on to someone who's more qualified as to whether uh as opposed to kind of screwing up and now right. that's going to be you, that you, you're going to be held accountable for that yeah so let's talk about your life a bit deeper you're mm. a the, the, the way we got in touch is because you got in touch with us for a kind of video project mm. um some months back but let's rewind it back. So you're a videographer by trade. Is that a good yeah. enough word? What would you class it? Cinematographer. Cinematographer that sounds so better. That, that okay. sounds very appealing. Videographer sounds like a guy who films weddings. Yeah, it sounds, yeah. One you're a cinematographer. Yeah. Let's put I some like respect that. on good, it. That's yeah. good, that's good. And uh, how did you get into it? And then how did that like lead you to then eventually, like how did you begin and how did it lead you okay. to eventually like where you're at now? Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, ever since I was a kid, I've always wanted to do something when it came to cameras. My dad had a camera. I would always just steal his camera, just take pictures, take videos, that sort of thing. And it got to a point, this was kind of just throughout my childhood, when I was getting a bit older, when I was like, mm, I want to say 16, 17. <clears throat> I think when you grow up in LA, there are multiple avenues you can take in terms of what kind of direction you want to go in life. And LA is known to be the place where it's the entertainment hub for multiple lanes of uh, careers when it comes to entertainment. And I unfortunately didn't have the strength as a teenager. I was a bit lost to take the route uh, that Islam would provide. So I, I just took one that was just the easiest for me and that would... Um, uh, I think at the time I wanted fame and I wanted things like that. And I just wanted to be around, I just wanted to be cool, basically. I think that's what a lot of people want to do when they're teenagers. So I took a route that was just basically, you're going to be in LA, you want to be, you want to just... There must be a lot of opportunities to do cinematography in LA. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Fine. So in a place like LA, there's a very easy way to just kind of climb the ladder and just meet people and be cool and that sort of thing. And so that's what I wanted. So I was like, okay, I, I see a very clear route right here. I have a basic understanding of cinematography. I mean, that comes from just uh, wanting to do these videos so bad and just film these types of videos. So what I would do is I would just go on YouTube and just, it was just self-taught basically. No courses or no person teaching me. So I started very simply, okay, I want my videos to look like this. 
And then I came across certain camera models and then I came uh, lenses. And then it came into the point where I finally got one in my hands. I was renting it. And it was just really weird because the first time I did like a test video and it got uploaded and people like publicly and people saw it. Everyone was going crazy. I was getting, and I was 16 at the time. I was getting calls like, who shot this? Oh, who really? These comments were like, who shot this? I need to know now. P and then um, it was given to a director uh, who I ended up working with later in my life. Um, he, uh, I think, was shown some of my work when I was 16, 17, and he was in the front seat of the car going like, he's 17 or he's this age. What? This is crazy. Because basically, I just, it's just, it was one of those things where I was just, I think I was, it was a very promising kind of uh, trade that I had at such a young age, um, shooting videos. So as things started progressing, um, naturally being in LA, it's just so easy to network. It's absolutely ridiculous how easy it is to That's, network. I suppose, why so many people go over there to network. Yeah, right? like I'll give you an example. It was just Eid, the Eid that passed right now. What me and my friends usually would do, it was three of us, uh, I think three or four of us, uh, my brother and two other friends. We There's this Muslim-owned coffee shop, not too far from the masjid that we prayed Eid prayer at. So we were like, okay, let's go. It's a Muslim-owned coffee shop. So we're going, and we're just having a coffee outside after Eid prayer. Uh, and then this one very well-known person from L.A. walks by. Like very well known, like I'm sure nationwide too, probably in the whole of America. And then I'm like, this guy. But not familiar. worldwide. Maybe not worldwide. Okay. So he's walking by, and I'm like, right, isn't that? And then my friend calls him over. And you would think that, you know, celebrities are kind of like a bit arrogant, but he was very down to earth and humble. And she so was like, so he was just chopping, he was chopping it up with my friend, and they were talking. And then he was like, wait, let me get my coffee. So he gets his coffee, he comes back out. And then we have an hour-long discussion about life and even religion, about Islam. And he was like, yeah, you know, my friends took me to the mosque before. And it feels, Islam feels good. And this guy's just a celebrity. I did not expect him to even say hi. What industry is he in? Uh, music industry. Okay. Music industry. So he, he talked about gang life and keeping up, like, like, keeping up appearances and just uh, peer pressure, that sort of thing. And I was like, I did not expect such a deep conversation with such a, like, a celebrity person. And then next thing you know, the shop owner comes out and he's kind of known himself and he's involved in the music industry as well and then he sees all of us in our thobes and he's like salam alaikum Eid mubarak and then this and that because we're kind of mutual and so we didn't expect to see him he's never at the shop so then the one day where we come he comes and then all of a sudden someone pulls up in a lambo truck just minutes later a lambo truck a lambo truck man i've not seen one of those in a person a lambo truck someone pulls up in a lambo truck and this person is known international it's a very famous person who's very well known and he pulls up in a lambo truck and i'm just like if this isn't LA described in a sitting, then I don't know what is. It's just this easy. It Things comes across just, like that. It comes across like, like everybody. You you like. It comes across like the American dream is you fly to LA, you get a job as a waiter or waitress, mm. and then you just work your way. And up then to you, you're sure you're you while you're doing that, you're auditioning for roles. That's exactly. Or you're trying. Or you're touring with your band, mm. and then along the way you network. You meet uh, while you're waiting. You meet agents. You meet managers. You meet celebs, and you try and climb your way up. That's what it comes across like from the outside. And that's exactly what it is. You see a lot of these people like living in these high rise buildings and like um, these apartment buildings or lofts in, in downtown LA or Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood area. It's actually a thing in the LA community. Like the native LA people really don't like these people. They, really? Because they just, they're not from here. And generally you want to welcome guests. But I think the thing that it's just they're bringing in so much traffic just the city's just getting very congested in general um but we oh, yeah, heard the la traffic is like the worst oh it's horrible uh i've been experiencing some of the london traffic i was trying to go to east london mosque and it was crazy i think the, the train would have been faster i'm not used to that actually the train being faster than driving the, the train system in la is like very not pleasant like in london it's quite nice like yeah it might be long it might be delays but in la it's just no one takes a trade in la it's just not something you want to be doing um so yeah. is the traffic worse in London or LA? Definitely LA. And the parking, I think, would be worse in LA too. People in LA don't leave their houses because they'll lose their parking spot. I've been with my friend and then I'm like, can you drop me off? He's like, no, I'm going to lose my parking spot. I'm going to lose it. I'm like, but just drop me off. And he was like, no, no. Like, Do they, I can't is, lose that parking spot. Isn't it common practice for people to have driveways in um, America? For the most part, yeah. Like but like uh, the part of LA that we're all from is just like all apartments. So it's just literally parking okay. lots or just street parking. Yeah. But when it does come to those drive, like there's parts of LA where it's just so easy to park because it's just those maybe uh, richer neighborhoods or yeah. just out in the middle of n nowhere part of LA where no one really goes to. So but yeah, does everyone just Uber and stuff? Basically, everyone's going to Uber. Like even if you have a car, you'll just Uber because you don't want to deal with the headache of just taking your car and parking it and just, oh, uh, it's just. Seems like having a car is pointless in LA. You know what? It's actually not pointless because it would be pointless if the transit system was good. But the transit system is so bad, bro. I mean, if you want to do Ubering everywhere, which is what I did when I was a little bit younger, I was a bit ignorant. So I just spent a bunch of money. Um, I would just Uber everywhere. It's good because the transit system isn't good. But 
the car is necessary, to be honest, because if you have like, okay, a New York transit system or London, very understandable, no need for a car, but it's it's really not good in LA. Okay, so um, let's get back on track with the story. Sorry, yeah. I pushed you away. No, um, I, I pushed myself No, away. you don't. I think, you that didn't. Was me. I think that was um, me. was, by the way, guys, like warning me so much before the episode is like, please interrupt me, please interrupt me. Like, I'm going to go off track. Tra- I'm, I'm known for track, doing track. that. I've been t- but this time I just feel track. Two people who go off track is not a good combination. Mm. Uh, so we're talking... Um, I think we're cinematography about 17 at this point, kind of slowly starting Fine. to get in. Okay. So we're at that point, And naturally, like I said in LA before I told the story about how easy it is to network, um, things just started lining up. Oh, you meet this person, you meet this person. And it got to a point where I was uh, very comfortably having my own sets and my own videos. Uh, and I was shooting those and I was making a good amount of money. And uh, on the other side, I was working uh, on sets for much bigger productions. And I was pretty much just uh, just camera department sometimes i do behind the scenes sometimes i'd be uh, camera operating for additional footage it was nothing too crazy uh but what i'm trying to get at here is that i did i think climb the ladder not all the way to the top maybe just i think i got my foot in the door basically um at a young age and at a very kind of fast because you're still young now you're 23 right i'm 21 21 21 yeah 21 bro you are so young i love it on homobetic uh, what I would you could say, pass for mm. like 24 but in a good way it's the beard it's the beard not in like a oh you look old way but just in a way where it's oh, like I, you I have sh- maturity you do walk with maturity a long bit nah, that's good alhamdulillah I get told that all the time oh it's the beard or like you just look older no 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 you because you're mature mm. yeah you have I get good that presence too, yeah, yeah. yeah alhamdulillah that's good but um I think if someone were to look at my portfolio, maybe the people that I've kind of worked with, uh, some of them have like higher profiles some of them a bit famous some m- most for most of them in America some of like very few in the UK but um for the most part, I think if someone were to honestly, anyone who knows the music industry or a- any industry, uh, if they look at just the names that were there and the work that I've done, I think they would say he would would have been on track to maybe be quite successful. Um, not to say that it was a good amount of work, but I think if someone would just look at it and just be humble about it, they were like, I think he was getting somewhere and he was quite young too. But I think what ended up happening and mind you this whole time my skills are just getting better and better and better and I've got a group of people gassing me up and they're just like oh keep going keep going and you would think that that's kind of the friend circle you would want because they're all supportive and I came from even a more kind of not friend circle like not good friend circle before so when I'm seeing this and a majority of them are Muslim too so I've grown up with all of them we all grew up with the message together um, that seems to be kind of the one you like the, the group you want to be with but what happened was uh, I'm working at an Islamic organization this whole time. So in the background, I'm, I'm, I'm doing bandits on the weekends, basically, in terms of just video shoots. But I'm still working at the masjid. And are you working at the masjid because you're passionate about it? Or are you working because you might just managed to get a job there? What were- I actually, everything is just qadr Allah. But what happened was 2018. So when I was basically 18 years old, um, my friend, well, a good friend of mine, um, his name is Muhammad, he... I just walked into the masjid one day and was about to go to my cousin's house, go have dinner. Um, and we were just praying a shat or something. And then he's like, hey, come over. I want to talk to you. Uh, he's a little bit older than me and pretty much just offered me a job. You know, masjid's looking for organizations just needs like a receptionist kind of person, just AV, microphones, lights, just help around the masjid. You'll get paid. It's not volunteering. And I was looking for a job at the time. I was doing, I was flipping, I was doing fast food at the time and it was really tough. Uh, I was going to uni at the time too. So I was like, Okay, let me do that. And so it wasn't necessarily a passion, but I'm 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 not gonna lie. A part of me deep down is like, I think this is the right choice. I feel like this is Allah's way of just bringing me back. Cause like I said, I'm in this kind of teenage years where you you just feel a bit lost. Fine. So at this so, point, you're like half half. You're like working in yeah, the shit, yeah. and you're doing the shoes. I'm doing this. And so slowly, what happens is, being in the house of Allah, you just you're gonna get pulled in, and it's beautiful. So what happened was, I think slowly my uh, practice just started going up. So meanwhile, I'm still getting better at these videos. I'm still shooting X, Y, and Z, but now I'm developing, I'm working on my prayer. I'm getting the five daily prayers down. I'm just practicing more. I'm just doing what I can to become a better Muslim, basically, and just submit to Allah. Um, and we all know that the prayer, there's an ayah in the Quran that says that the prayer like removes evil and immorality, basically. So I think that what happened was basically just the more I started praying, because the first thing I said was, I know there's going to be a bunch of things that I can't handle right now, but let me just focus on the prayers. These five daily prayers are going to be important. So let me just focus on these and I'll, I'll worry about the rest later. I'll just take it step by step. So I was doing these videos, but I started praying. So I started praying, I got the five daily prayers down. And as that kind of just went along, more things just started getting easier for me. And so when that happens, I think naturally I was just like, this doesn't feel right. I'd be at video shoots and I'm just looking, I'm like, no, it feels a bit weird to me. Ethically, I don't. So do you feel like the prayer was like slowly purifying your soul? 
that's basically what it was. And the prayer literally, like, it takes you out of these environments that you don't want to be in. That's why um, I remember we said Abu Taymiya was talking about how he used to be like a football player, right? And so these uh, people giving dawah, like to younger people on the streets, used to always take up like an hour of his time. And he would really not like that. And then he talked about a story where he like, gave advice to someone and he kept it, he just kept it very simple, five daily prayers. Because the prayer will take you out of these sins, basically. It will remove that immorality from you. So he told a story about where he seen a bunch of guys just outside the shop or something. Went up, he just, hey, he was like, guys, two minutes, just pray five daily prayers. That's all I'm going to say. Assalamu alaikum. And then I think a year or two later, sometime later, he seen one of the brothers from Umrah. He's like, do you remember me? And Ustad's like, uh, no. And he's like, you, you, you gave me the sihah outside of the shop. And he has really? a big beard now. And it's just like, I just think that for me, that was everything. Just five daily prayers, just connection with Allah. And that was able to take me out of that environment. Uh, but it was, a, it was a slow process of that purification. It was just a slow step of like, hmm. Let me stop, for example, let me stop swearing. Then it was like, okay, the friend circle and that environment really finally taking, like just leaving it, that was a really long process. But the prayer and connection to Allah and just submission to Allah, it's going to just, you, you naturally, a person will. Like it's just, it's just going to happen. Like you're just going to feel like you're not, you just, things just don't feel right. Like you talk about your Itikaf story and you're just like, it's just one of the things where it's just like, um, sorry, I think it was Muslim Bala's Itikaf story about music. So he done Itikaf in the masjid. And before that, people were telling him, stop music. And he's just like, yeah, I don't want to hear it. And then when he came out of the masjid, he said he went into the car and someone played music and he was just like, nah, just turn it off. It just it, doesn't, it just feels too impure for me. And it was just that natural. And so I feel like that's how it was for me. It's just a process. And it just naturally, things just started just, it was easy to just kind of stop doing certain things. Yeah. So what was the turning point? Turning point. Um, I would say the turning point. Okay. I remember this specifically. I was... And I have to be vague here, obviously. Um, I took a step back when I saw myself editing a video with things that were unethical. But at this point, I had stopped listening to music because I'm aware of the rulings of, of music. And uh, actually, uh, for music, I think during Ramadan, what I did was, uh, one of the previous Ramadans, I just, I, I said, look, I can't really handle this whole cutting out music thing right now. Let me just, for the month of Ramadan, for sure I can do this. I can do this for Allah. And I just felt this peace, just this contentment and tranquility I've never felt in my life before. And before that, I even did that. It was just a matter of, I'm just doing it for the month. But after I came out of that month, I was like, bro, what do I need this for? Mm. I played uh, one of these new albums and I was just like, I just paused it. Just like Muslim Bilal. It just, it just didn't feel right. I don't know if it was Muslim Bilal, but somebody gave this advice that I thought was really powerful once, which they, in which they said that, um, they said what they did, I can't remember who this was. Oh no, it was actually a brother that I met in it to Kaf. And he said, what I did is I, first of all, stopped, because back then, this is seven years ago now, mm, the way to listen to music was still on your iPhone or your iPod. So iPod. you either had an iPod or on your iPhone, you had the iPod app. Okay. And you would download music or mm. buy music and it would be stored on your phone or your iPod. Okay. Whereas now, obviously, everything's streaming. Just, yeah. And so it might not work now, but it could, I guess, like if you had playlists or something. What he said is, first step he took was he stopped downloading new music onto his phone okay <coughs> so, so he could only limited. listen to okay. what he had you're just limiting it okay you're right. starting somewhere yeah and then once a month he mm -hmm. would delete an album or okay. once a week something like yeah. that one album at a time mm -hmm. and he did it until he got down to one album mm -hmm. so any so then he would only listen to that one album okay. And then he started deleting tracks from the album. Mm. And it got down to when he started, he only had one song left. Mm. And then he deleted that song and he managed to get to that one. I thought, oh, that's amazing technique because it is, it's, 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 it's that step-by-step -step yeah. technique, yeah. And um, now I guess you could go, <coughs> obviously now it's tough because you have access to every song in the world always. Yeah. But I suppose if you have Spotify, most people probably have their playlists, their mm. gym playlist, yeah, their yeah, like exactly, calm playlist exactly. and stuff okay, like that for okay. when they're at home. And I suppose, or your driving place, I suppose what you could do is you could start deleting uh, individual tracks on the playlist or something like yeah. that, right? Uh, but then again, yeah. I, I suppose that's not a ruling. I should, I should make that clear because I know that I've also heard from a, from a ruling perspective, okay. like, uh, you, you, like the, you also should um, cut things at the root and not look and back. And not have to just... Right. Yeah. So I'm not saying from a ruling perspective. Oh, I yeah. suppose I'm coming from like a habit perspective. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of like the correct way, if somebody is struggling with that, like, you know, go to a person of knowledge yeah, and find out like yeah. the best way you can mm. cut that out. 100%. Um, 
Yeah. So we were talking yeah. about you stopping music and and yeah. or, or, or or sorry, not you stopping music necessarily, but we were talking about the fact that you put an album on, you pause and you're like, this is not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was the, at that the point. turning point. Yeah, so that was the point I was at. So privately, um, I was not listening to music and the industry that I was involved in is just in the same realm, basically, uh, with the videos that I was doing. I mean, so everything entertainment is going to yeah, be Yeah, naturally. So basically, privately and internally, I'm rectifying myself because, okay, I'm finding out that, okay, this is something that you want to stay away from. It's not good for your slam. And so I'm at that point. But now comes the hard part of, okay, when I'm when the doors are closed and the sh- curtains are shut, I have no problem with not listening to music. I've tasted the sweetness of leaving off that music. Like, it, it's called on only, like, et cetera. Like, it's, it's amazing. But now I'm at the point where publicly I need to make some changes because I'm, I'm now, lear- I'm just learning little things about the religion. So now I'm learning that, okay, private sins are one thing. Public sins are another thing. So you now having this stuff publicly is not okay. And I'm like, oh, but, I don't actually listen to music. I'm just doing certain things and it's just public. I don't really listen to that. But then it just feels a bit like antithetical because um, I guess the turning point was I was on my laptop. I was doing an editing session and on the screen is one thing. And your heart is something else. And my heart is something else. And literally in my AirPods is actual Quran. I'm editing this thing which is very unethical on my screen, but I muted the the, the audio and I'm listening to Quran because it was a color grading session, but I'm still playing. So I really like what, what, what editors normally do is they just have the, the track playing or whatever is playing. But I muted it and I put Quran in my ear, but I'm editing this. That was the one where I just took a step back and I'm like, I'm looking at what's on my screen. I'm, I'm just listening to the Quran. I'm just like, I think something has to change here. And that was the point where I was like, okay, I'm already, I've, I've finished off this whole private thing of listening to music and um, that's been easy, but that was a whole journey on itself. But publicly, like this is the hard part because it's been years of hard, hard work, work. Yeah. and it's not only the fact that money's been put into it, time has been put into it, but I guess it was a bit arrogant, arrogant of me to think this, but everyone's seen my hard work and like for me to give up, it feels like I, f- I felt like I'd be weak if I gave up and it wasn't giving it up because you're lazy. It's simply because you, you know that this is not good for you. And that do you feel like that everyone that everyone gets that moment where it's like they're ready to do it and then Shaitan comes at that last point. That's like, exactly what it turn was. back. Like mm. Shaitan will list out all of the fears. Yeah. And that's what happens when you're about to do something great and when you're about to do something incredible, Shaitan will test you with like the, the worries and thoughts. Stuff, yeah. And that's happened to me for multiple things, marriage and, and other things. But um, I think when I got those thoughts, I'm like, I think... I've heard so many talks about Shaitan tests you and that when you're about to do something, so I'm just like, I think this is the right decision. So slowly what I started doing was limiting, I think the uh, gigs that I was doing, basically the type of shoots I was doing, I would try to keep it very limited to a very close, small circle, as opposed to hit my DMs, anyone, I'll charge you this much, this much, whatever. I started to also kind of <laughs> like in the back of my mind, try to make things ethical, like at least just clean up what I'm doing. Like it's not the best, but I, I couldn't just cut it off to just, like just cut through. I couldn't really do it like that. It was so hard for me to do music. Uh, just listening to it privately, I was able to do that. But publicly, it was hard. So I started just, okay, limiting the amount of gigs. I got down to like two or three people, one celebrity. I was like, this is it. After this, like I, I, beyond these three, four people, like no more. But then you just you just get to a point where... You can't have one foot in, one foot out anymore. No, you can't. You just It just doesn't make sense for you. Like, And I just didn't feel comfortable standing before Allah having to answer for... Um, this is another thing, actually. Um, I didn't realize that publicly, you know these views that just start stacking up. And I've worked on some videos that have gotten, not to be arrogant, but just a, a good amount. I'm going to say millions. So my contribution to that video... Was substantial. Was substantial. Oh, not that it was substantial, but it was a contribution. I we tried to make it Jamaican. Yeah, yeah. So no, but it was probably actually no. Hold on, I shouldn't be saying that. I should be making you feel better. It, it was a contribution, regardless. And uh, how awful of me. Shots. No, you're great. Shot, shots were shots were in the video, so my my contribution is clearly there. I'll, it might not have been much, but right. I know the weight of that in Islam. Of is course, like, of course, of course. So that's stacking up against me, and I really let those views get to my head in a good way because I'm like, nah, I, like me and my grave. Those views just going, going, going. I don't like that idea. I want good to continue going let's have the that sort of thing that's what i want counting and and just stacking up not views for this this sort of video that's just stacking up so um it just came to a point where specifically uh i'm, I'm ready to make the decision but i'm just a little scared what i used to do is i used to go for runs uh, maybe i don't look like i run but um i would go on runs sunday mornings uh, and other days uh, and you do look like you run okay thank you um but you do 
I found a brother on Twitter actually named Hassan. He's so he lives here. He's in, he's in West London. I actually just met him in person for the first time yesterday. But basically, he had a similar story of leaving and just changing for the, just giving up for the sake of Allah. And so I DM'd him, um, and he gave me advice. Like he was like, "Bro, do it," because I was like, "I'm scared." Like I've I've done it privately, but publicly, it's just I, this this kind of industry and like career path is all I've really done for the past few years. I just feel like a bit I don't sure, know, sure. but I'm ready to do it. But like I was just I just needed someone to kind of push me. Uh, I DM'd some other brothers too, but he was the main one who was like, "Okay, bro, here's my number. WhatsApp me, send me like we'll FaceTime." And he was so just ready to be there for me and just like support me because he went through something similar. And so from there, we would exchange WhatsApp messages, and he was he really just told me, "Okay, bro, trust me. This is the right decision. You're doing the right thing. Allah will replace." All this was so much better and you won't even be able to understand. You'll look back at this and be like, like, wow. Because at the time I was doing it, I was just like, I got put in four years of hard work and people are going to see that I'm just taking this change. Uh, I really don't feel like I have much beyond this. Plus my friend circle is going to change too. I know for a fact my friend circle is going to change um, in terms of the people. Maybe they won't stop being my friend, but they might just not be around me so much because we, we, we would always be together for work kind of related things now that I'm not working in that field. What reason is there for us to be that, you know, tight knit like we were? Um, but he was like, bro, if you give up something for the sake of Allah, he will replace it with much better. And just constant dua and I guess prayer. Uh, and I did that happen? It did happen. I've always wanted to, and, and so, so, so multiple things happened. And now that I look back at it, it was a great decision I made. And alhamdulillah, I would never look back. Um, m- my life's turned to like complete 180. I'm in London now. I'm from LA. Like, act like the, free, the, the, the yeah. I mean, I'm used to watching Freshly Grounded episodes, and now that I'm on, it's just really weird to me. So for sure, things have happened, um, and it's all from a lot. Um, did you go through like a point where you had like an emotional breakdown in in all of this when you were yeah, you were yeah, changing actually. things like? You just it all got on top of yeah, you yeah, and yeah. you just broke down and mm. started crying and there stuff. was multiple actually what i used to do is i used to this is kind of nearing the edge where i had that realization where i was like i gotta stop this my heart just didn't feel right and it was weird because i was working at the masjid i used to go open the, the masjid for fajr uh, my dad used to go with me and i think a person who's opening a masjid for fajr you're, you're in a good position you're allowing other muslims to come and to worship allah but still i felt very something wasn't right in my heart i just felt heavy just felt heavy. It reminds me of Suleiman's story uh, when he was walking up Quba Mosque or something and he just, his weight up the stairs just like, it just felt, he just felt heavy. I remember him saying, Something yeah. like that. And then I just felt something similar. Like I just, um, I think that might fall right there. The I was, H6. I think, I think it was coming off the edge. Um, I, I think I just felt, just something didn't feel right. And so I remember this period of one to two weeks, every day I was coming in the masjid, opening the masjid as I did. Um, it was just weird because usually at Fajr I have this sweetness. It just feels amazing praying congregation, this sort of thing, see the brothers, it's always the same people. And then I just felt like something was off. What I would do every night before I slept, I had a, uh, I would go on my Instagram, I had a saved collection, I had a bunch of reminders. I would just look at them, I just got emotional every single time. And that reminder every night, I don't do that anymore unfortunately, it doesn't hit me that well, but I don't know how, but every single night I would look at the sa- same exact reminders, there's nothing new. Was it one reminder? No, it was a, it was like a plethora of reminders, it was like a few different ones. What were some of them, do you remember any of them? Um, some were for sure about Spot Project. I know that for sure because that organization touched my heart really deeply because I just, you see these kids who have maybe not so much like we have, but they have happiness. They they feel so content with everything and they've got the biggest smiles on their faces, yet the material world around them is is substantially less than what I have in Los Angeles. But I'm over here complaining about the littlest things. So I saw that and I was like, I think there's just, more to life than just material things and i think everyone goes through that phase what form did these reminders take were mm-hmm. they was it something that you wrote down was it a video that you'd watch it, th- so specifically it was like videos from spot project the pictures okay. that i would see from abu Bakr and reminders that he would do um and recitation of the quran just a hadith being just on certain videos um reminders from you know certain just people um and I would watch these exact same ones and every night, like before I go to sleep, that was my routine. My brother would like leave the house at a certain time of the night. I would wait till he was gone so he wouldn't see me crying. And then it just, it would just get me emotional every single time. Um, and that was the moment where I was like, okay, I think I know why. It's because this career path that I'm kind of in, no matter how nice I might be opening the masjid, being in the masjid for every congregational prayer, whatever it might be, something's externally, the career path, that's got to change. So... Yeah. Although it's better for me to be a person who's praying in the masjid and being a practicing Muslim and still doing that than doing that and not praying at all. 
obviously, but still it was like, nah, like the right thing to do is just to leave it all behind. And, and alhamdulillah, it's, like I said, just my life's taken a 180. I'm, I'm in places I would never expect to be in. Uh, it's just amazing, alhamdulillah. Amazing. So uh, before we round up, mm. bro, like what's the plans now? You're in London, you moved here. Mm. You're, it's a fresh start, a fresh life yeah, yeah. basically for yourself. What's the plans? Plans for the most part. Um, I'm going back to uni. That should be starting uh, inshallah in January. Inshallah. Um, basically, I was in uni, and then I started working at the masjid. Uh, naturally, as you do, if you're young and you're making a good amount of money, and you're in a masjid, you just get a little bit comfortable. And I was doing so much, and my time was getting taken up. Plus, I was doing videos on the side, so I paused. But alhamdulillah, now I'll be returning. Uh, now I'm married, so I'm sure that's going to take a good amount of time, and that will be a journey on its own. Um, but other than that, honestly, the, the the main thing for me is just to just worship Allah and just grow in my religion. That's one of the things that I wanted to come to London for, uh, besides other reasons. But I just feel like the access here to teachers who you can relate to more, people like we said, Yahya and um, them. We don't really have too much of that in LA. We have maybe older teachers that it's a bit hard to connect to them. And just a few weeks ago, I went to uh, South Hall Masjid. Uh, we said Yahya and we said Abu Abdelaziz were giving a talk, and one of the teacher. Oh, is that Dar es Salaam? Dar es Salaam Masjid, yeah. So I went with my brother, and I'm like, he, he's a person who necessarily wouldn't want to go to these types of things. But I was like, bro, trust me, it's not like LA. Like, you're going to walk in, you're going to be like, it's going to be sick. And there was two brothers I knew from Instagram uh, that was like, yeah, we'll be there. Just, you know, just tap me on the shoulder. I'm wearing the black though, whatever. So when I came in, it was just a room full of young brothers. On a Wednesday night, I'm just like, I'm not used to this. Like, for, for people in London, that might be regular. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, people go to lessons all the time. But we don't have the stuff like that in LA, especially with, like, good teachers like that. And proper like methodology and etc um so having things like that is really what makes me comfortable with being here and makes me want to just learn more about the religion having uh institutes uh that you can just go to and learn and and teachers that are more relatable basically i think is really important for me so uh seeing that message and the people that were there and it was actually such a fun experience i knew no one in that message personally i never met them before but i just felt so welcomed yeah and that's just imagine. the brotherhood aspect of islam um and it was just really good. And I think even my brother felt that. And like I said, he necessarily wasn't a person who thought like he would be at those types of events. When we're walking in, we prayed our Turaqa and then after we sat down. But he told me like, personally, we felt a bit like intimidated. We don't know any of these brothers. And I think Shaitan is just testing you like when you're going to a big gathering with brothers and like, you know, being in a house in, in the house of Allah where, you know, Quran is being recited and et cetera. Um, we're being tested like, oh, no, nah, we should leave. We don't want to be here. It's like we feel intimidated, but we stuck it out. And, and we we met these brothers and Abu Musa was there and he was just like a whole character on his own and just we if it just felt like Abu, Abu Musa, Abu Musa Abu he, so he did he talk to you about making money I asked him about making money uh, we were all gonna go eat after but something came up but it, it's just that like all, all I expected was salams here and there but then a group of brothers just came around us when we were eating pizza and just like oh you're from America do you know this person this person? and it was just so friendly and I had never met these brothers before but it just felt so welcoming and I think to end it all off and this is a very firm confirmation for me that I think this is a good move for me. It was my brother, like I said, who doesn't normally want to come to these types of things. I wouldn't find himself doing so unless I kind of convinced him. There was a question that was asked to one of the teachers. The first one was uh, from a sister, like, what piercings can we get? So it was, a, it was a specific one. But the second one was very vague. It was like, what if a person is constantly trying to turn to Allah, but they keep slipping up, but they keep going back? It was one of them questions. So I knew it was going to be deep. And I'm looking at my brother because he's got his own journey. And... The teacher was answering in one of those really beautiful ways of just like, you know, always turn back to Allah, et cetera, et cetera. And I looked at my brother and he was crying. Wow. He was getting emotional and he was getting really touched by that. So I just said, if this is an indication that I think that we have access to, uh, it's better than LA, basically. I just said, I think this is the indication right here. Um, so inshallah, my uh, understanding of the, li of the religion will increase by being near great teachers and other brothers who are just going to help you. Uh, I think the brotherhood is a lot stronger here. Um, don't get me wrong, there's brothers in LA for sure, but I just, the one one night in the masjid was well, crazy. I, I think that it could have a lot to do with the brothers here and stuff, mm. but also I think a lot of it, you don't give yourself enough credit for because it's not easy to message people you've never met, mm, to yeah, get yeah. It, it, like really stuck it's into tough, a community. Yeah. And I, one thing I've noticed with you, and even the way we connected, is you're not afraid to to get in touch with people and yeah. ask people questions and and uh, connect with people and meet yeah. people. I think that comes from being from LA. You're just you're in a, you're in that networking environment. So why not take that and make it in a way that's going to benefit you? Probably, bro. You're amazing Muslims, at it. Yeah. I, 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 we when uh, you know Jazakallah Khairi invited us well, to your yeah. wedding. When we went there, there were so many people there. 
that we knew already. Yeah, it was Sadiq. And it was like, how do you know this person? How do you know this person? And it's like, wait, the guys in LA, like, yeah. Even some of the uncles who, um, they they frequent the masjid that my father-in-law like goes to. Um, when I seen them after after the wedding, so I went to them, and they were like. Hey, how do you know? How do you know? Um, so yeah, how did you know this? I was just like, oh, like, how did, like everyone just knows. Yeah, because you, you just connect with everyone. And I think that's amazing. Don't ever lose that. And um, I also want to say to anyone uh, listening to this, if they're from London, uh, don't feel shy to get in touch with Munaim and uh, and yeah. uh, and show him around. You know, yeah, uh, because he's a uh, he's. I was, I was gonna say he's a guest, but you're no longer a guest. You're. I'm still a guest because I'm still learning my way around uh, Whitechapel. I think I've got down. Uh, yeah, it's weird because I've, I've hard. I've been to Whitechapel. I could count on one hand how many times mm. I've been. Because I'm from West London, so it's so far. Yeah, yeah I, everything. I, if it's more than ten minutes, I'm like. Ugh. I'm so I'm not think local, London, but inshallah, I get uh, acquainted with the West London area. East London is it's comfortable for me now, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll bring you over to yeah. West eventually. Inshallah, we'll inshallah. work on it, inshallah. Uh, Jazakallah khair, oh, yeah. um, for this uh, lovely, lovely episode and for being so vulnerable with us and sharing us, sharing with us your story. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, for those listening, Jazakallah khair for listening. We'll see you next week on Fresh Grind for episode 248, I believe. We're just a few weeks away from our live event, episode 250, which Munaim will be DOPing. Yes, inshallah. Uh, be Munaim there. is going to be the director of photography, meaning he'll be uh, running the videography. Yeah. Why is it called DOP director when it's photography. video? Um, is there such thing as DOV? DOV sounds weird. Yeah. Um, interesting enough, DOP, director of photography, um, in captures video and creative does it capture photography at all what, what's interesting is that the dop the so director of photography actually doesn't always camera operate they have separate camera operators sometimes sometimes yeah. the, the the actually they call them dps they call them dps fine so you're just a director which are not just director. that's the main job i'm saying I like say I'm, I'm more of a dp cinematographer person that I, if i'm gonna class myself as anything yeah. but as in on, on the live then you're gonna be oh, a yeah, dpc yeah. you're gonna yeah, be yeah. a dpc cm dp what's the cm the for? Di- director of photography cameraman camera okay. cinema man DPC, cinema photographer like yeah, yeah. yeah inshallah uh, but yes um, I'm very much looking forward to that and seeing uh, whoever's got a ticket it's sold out now uh, but inshallah we'll be doing these events regularly uh, the whole idea of a house show is that it's very small very easy to operate very um, easy logistically for us to put together uh, and it's like a packaged black box event uh, that doesn't require much just a dark room and a spotlight TEDx style and uh, and inshallah then the big events obviously will be as always hopefully bringing back on uh, every six months so maybe we can do like the idea is potentially maybe to do like these every six months and then the house shows like every month or something eventually but we'll have to see how it goes uh but let's see how the first one goes sure. that being said guys we'll see you next week on episode 240 i've also just realized that i'm wearing uh a t-shirt that says atlanta georgia and it, and it almost looks like i'm patronizingly wearing a t-shirt that has an american state on it yeah, i'm not because i'm with an american and also you're 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 from uh, California, yeah. which is kind of is either patronizing and derogatory or it's offensive, <laughs> and so either way, it's not positive. So I apologize, but I did just throw on whatever I had. But like the, the frustrating thing is, is that my room, sorry, the room that I have my clothes in, mm-hmm. is the room. Uh, is is the children's room? Okay. Right. I don't keep my clothes in my. I, actually, I keep some clothes in my room, but others in mm. in their room. And so the frustrating thing is that often when I'm leaving the house, mm-hmm. they're asleep. They're like yeah. having a nap or something. And the same was today. So you just kind of blindly grab anything. So that's what mm. happened. So I apologize <laughs> for offending <laughs> you and patronizing you. <laughs> Guys, we'll see you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.